Hello everyone and welcome to episode 22 of the Nurtured by Nature podcast. Today I am delighted to be joined in conversation by the amazing Polly Hearsay. Polly is a business mentor with a master's degree in environmental science and a background in nature conservation. Together we embark on a fascinating and inspiring conversation, delving into the empowering concept that governmental policy doesn't change culture, but rather it is culture that ultimately dictates policy. We reflect on the phase shift for humanity that is needed and how by learning to actively listen to nature and engage her principles for ecosystem health, we can shape businesses capable of offering a way to heal our greatest collective wound. Polly's vision, utilising a move away from the societal predisposition towards linear thinking to an understanding of the interconnected complex web that creates conditions to thrive, sees rewilded businesses incorporate ideas for diversity and collaboration over competition, allowing them to be actively engaged in nature and their communities with their environmental and social responsibilities ingrained at every level as a functional part of their core DNA. Well, welcome Polly. It's really lovely to have you joining us on this episode of the Nurtured by Nature podcast. I'm quite excited to talk with you today and learn a bit more about what you do and some of the wisdom you're going to be sharing with us all. Um, I just tend to get started my conversations with my guests by asking them to share a little bit about their nature story and really whatever that means to you, how nature has been a part of your life and if your connection with nature has changed and evolved over time. So if there's anything that you would like to share about nature and how it's been part of your life, that would be lovely. Well, it's it's, it's an interesting one because I don't think of myself as somebody who sort of like has these moments where, you, I mean, I might have moments where I just go, oh yeah, okay. But I, you know, things things unravel. I mean, I think they do for us, for us all. But so I was kind of reflecting a little bit about where did I sort of learn to appreciate nature and how did I learn to appreciate nature and actually it came to me last week because um I realized that something that has always been part of my life as I actually lost last week which is that um my pony I had to have her put down last week oh, so that. was that yeah, yeah but the thing the thing that really beyond the sadness of it that hit me is that I have always had that need to be outside yep I've been outside in all weathers. It doesn't matter, you know, if it's three foot of snow, I still had to go. Yeah. And so my whole life, I have been around the elements and nature every single day. And it's really, really strange now to over this last week to not have that need to go outside. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I was also sort of reflecting on, well, actually, yeah, that, that's how I get next nature. Because the thing about with, when you're around horses, nature's not scared of horses. <laughs> They're scared of people. So I've had some of the most amazing experiences in my life. I remember sort of like pootling along the road and all of a sudden this brown ball rolled out of the hedgerow. And there were two stoats or weasels. I, you know, they didn't stay still long enough to work that one out. Yeah. And they they were bumbling along the road in a territorial fight and they didn't give two hoots that I was there because I was on a horse yeah. and I, I followed them for about 200 yards going oh, in, in and out of the hedge and on another occasion I was like trotting along the road and all of a sudden I had this barn owl next to me and I trotted next to this barn owl for about a quarter of a mile as it swooped oh. along the field and it's just like yeah so you know I, I guess that's where nature has always been a part of my um interpretation of life if you like it's it's what I've always seen about well you know what's important in life but um yeah my my connection has changed considerably over the years it's been something that um I I did I did my degree and then I got to the end of my degree and just suddenly went and there was all sorts of things kicking off and I just suddenly went I need to go off and do something environmental 
so I kind of went off and did something environmental I did a master's um, in environmental management then I ended up working with a conservation charity okay. and then that's gone <laughs> then I sort of changed jobs and then I eventually became you know started working for myself and the thing that was really difficult was that this incredibly important part of myself that wasn't part of my business Okay. so there I was doing marketing and doing business development and all this and there was just like there was this other piece of me that I was trying to find a way to bring in and really over the last few years my relationship with nature has shifted because now instead of watching it and observing it and appreciating it I've moved into listening to it okay okay yeah. does that a big kind shift. of make sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No. so it's, so it's like 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 listening to what, what, what what's it saying what does it want what does it need and and it, it dawned on me this year I do a lot of uh, work in the community with um biodiversity protection so you know whether that's sort of like keeping our verges sort of like uncut and unscathed yeah. and stuff um and one of the things that frustrates me hugely around here because it's a very rural area is when people drive all over the verges. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm and also it, uh, in a, a rural village and yes it is it's surprising isn't it they mm. erode it quite dramatically over hugely the I mean we've got one little one verge that I look after and we've lost two foot of it in it, oh, the last wow. two years wow. because the tractor's getting on it and what it, I realized was actually how physically I feel that loss yeah it's not just oh that's such a shame I feel it. it actually hurts when I see someone chopping down a tree that should have been allowed to be there or somebody's mm. chewing up the land or polluting it or dumping stuff you know that yeah. I really so I think that's one of the things about having learning to listen to the land is it like I just feel how disrespectful it is and how invisible it's become to people yeah I think I think you're you're right culturally I mean obviously the listeners um of this podcast probably um maybe they don't feel that because it's not to them but I think culturally as a whole you're right we nature is invisible um probably at best sometimes it's even worse than that it's just seen as a problem isn't it and um you know inconvenience <laughs> laws to protect nature I mean there's a lot of chat talk about that at the moment isn't it of of how the laws are just yeah. you know making it difficult for progress <laughs> we, lo we love that yeah. word don't we yeah, and, do. um, it is but it it is sad that culturally we we've just become so disconnected from it haven't we removed from it our lives are not entwined with it anymore and it's I mean, that's finding our thing, way isn't back it? isn't it yeah when it becomes a nuisance you're not actually saying that we we depend on it so it's to say that we deserve to have more space for businesses or houses or whatever at the expense of nature. I really struggle to wrap my head around that because if we don't have nature, we don't have anything to have a business with. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's at our own expense as well, isn't it? I yeah, think that's, absolutely. that's the thing is it, you know, it impacts our, you know, there's lots of studies about mental health oh, yeah. as well as obviously health, wellness um, and Air, air quality you know <laughs> the trees help yeah. with that hugely don't they so I think it is very short-sighted isn't it and I think obviously as a uh, society that's particularly what we've become haven't we quite sort of um in rewards driven like you know we want immediate um yeah yeah rather than this sort of longer term which time that nature that sort of nature timeline isn't it of which yeah. is completely different to our general and and in business I guess that's part of what your business is about isn't it is basically tuning in more to that sort of rhythm of nature and how we the, can learn yeah. from that there, there's there's so much toxic thinking in business I mean it's extraordinary it's like we have to have results now we have to have uh you know you have to always be growing you have to always be doing and there's and there is just this plethora of this is how you do it you know here's seven steps I can guarantee you're going to get results and the thing is there is no single solution in nature um, not to get too controversial and too sidetracked, but if you take something like electric cars, yeah. 
which are being pushed as a universal global solution. Yeah. Now, if there's one thing that nature tells us, it's that when you have a dominance of anything, you get system collapse. Yeah. And so we need to have multiple solutions. And those solutions have to be born of place. And when I say born of place, that's about the person who's bringing them forward, where they are, what their life has given them and, and the place that they find them in self, themselves in, because that's how you create a unique solution. And in unique solutions, you create diversity and in diversity, you create, create resilience and strength. That's what an ecosystem is. It is not a linear thing. It is this complex web. And we've got so linear in our thinking that we look at a we look at something and we we just we don't see the interconnections. So if you look at all the all the research that's being done about, um, you know, so just going, wow, trees communicate. It's like, well, if we don't, <laughs> you know, it's like remembering something that, you know, people could have told you a very long time ago. Yeah. Or, but if you actually stop and listen, you realize that, you know, the oak tree is supporting uh, an entire ecosystem there is actually just down the road from me there is this amazing old oak tree and you look up into her branches and there is a visible ecosystem in her branches she's got ferns growing out of her moss covering it's just you know that there is an entire world yeah, that's think, living there I mean there's there's research on it isn't there and it's it's staggering it's like over 2,000 different species are dependent on our ancient oak trees and you know, it, I mean, that's quite incredible if you if you thought of that in terms of people and you brought like 2000 people together and they were all dependent on one person, you'd you'd think that person had something quite special. But we just don't seem to be able to kind of put that association with with nature, do we? We seem to have mm -hmm. we have such a disconnect that we just can't like value these these amazing beings, really, because that's what they are, aren't they? And and see the wealth of what they offer and what they give to us and um mm. i've been doing a lot of thinking about what we see and what we don't see uh recently in terms of you know we, we're an apex species and we all and, and the whole point of life is to become this apex species the apex of the apex if you like that's what our cultures push us towards it's like to be the, in the elite the problem is that it depends upon everything that's underneath it and there are multiple layers underneath it and what we do is we we harvest we scrape we take all of everything out of the middle and we are completely unaware of the importance of the most important things to life so we don't think you know we're not protecting plankton we're not protecting soil bacteria when you know the things that are invis invisible to us and seem to be sort of like mucky or whatever or um you know, I don't know. I don't know what the thinking is. Invisible. But it, it's they are invisible. invisible. That's the that's the thing, isn't it? Like what you're what you're saying there is. I mean, they're the really invisible parts of the sort of visible spectrum of nature, aren't they? You know, the yeah. the tiny microscopic organisms that we've we've just. I mean, part of it is, I guess, science developing to a stage that we can. We've now got the kind of technology to really study them, but also just disregarding them and and just not seeing them at all and so therefore not giving them any importance in mm. what they contribute to the ecosystem as a whole and yes yeah. um yeah it's, it is you're right the invisible and that comes back to again doesn't it that visibility of nature to people it's it's is extraordinary because of course we're doing we're we're recording this the week after the sycamore was felled on Hadrian's Wall. Yeah. And it, it's it's extraordinary, isn't it, that you can have such this this visceral sadness in a community because of a single tree. And granted, it was pretty much the only tree in that landscape. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, so it is going to be very prominent. And yet not to have that for other things. So, you know, is it, is it because it's a landscape feature? <laughs> I, I, I was just, yeah, I think, you know, it's horrendously think... sad, but... I've been sort of grappling with that a little bit this week as well, trying to work out like why that one particular tree and maybe, and I was thinking maybe it's just that that 
tree has come at a point that it's brought to a climax like a lot of feeling that's been sort of rippling through society we we've had a lot in the UK haven't we have frustrations around government or organizations not delivering and I think maybe part of it is it was a very like visible kind of act of like representing like this whole greater sort of feeling and emotion and mm. I think it was it was one of those cases of almost like the straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing and and that was the straw that everyone focused on but actually I think the immediate kind of upwelling of emotion was seems much deeper rooted and I think it's just been a sort of building and building and that was the bit that it sort of just poured out through and um Yes, yeah, such a yeah. random, pointless destruction. It's and and which is typical that we see. Um, I, I I I get a lot of emails from from the um, all of the petition platforms. Yeah, and one of the things in there is the extraordinary cruelty to animals. Yeah, you just go. Where does this mentality come from? And that to me is is a representation of how disconnected we are how fundamentally disconnected we are of you know and, and increasingly so when we're behind computer screens all day yeah but our education system isn't really supporting people to understand that the natural world or feel comfortable in it to feel safe in it and, you know the people i re remember a story from a few years ago somebody saying uh, um that they used to have an annual pony club camp and there was a pond two fields away and when they first started doing it every, the first day the kids would be down at the pond playing around and over the years they got closer and closer to the, they didn't find the pond they didn't go beyond the field until now they just don't go beyond the field that they're in and that's to me is a is a really sad reflection of how little we feel collectively how how a little safety we feel in exploring yeah. the environment and it's how dangerous it is you know people will see um you know grass snake and freak out because they don't know that it's yeah. not dangerous and yeah. of course we get this exposure to information from other countries where of course she would run in the other direction fast but you know with th that lack of connection and respect for the environment makes it invisible and when it's invisible nobody sees the loss we don't see how it's degrading over time uh, and i i find that i find that so hard because yeah. i i live in this mountain you know right on the edge of the mountains it, on the face of it it's this incredibly beautiful landscape and people who've moved, and we've got a lot of people who've moved into this area, and they go, oh, it's, but it's so beautiful. I said, yes, but look at it. Look at it. You tell me where you can see the juvenile oak that is going to replace the mature oaks, mm -hmm. because there is not one, not a single, I mean, there's yeah. just one that I planted a few years back. Yeah. That's it. And I, I keep my fingers crossed it doesn't get flailed. Yeah. Um, but it's not, and the hedges are all going to rack and ruin because they're not fenced off and the sheep are eating them all and you actually look at it and the the, the it's overgrazed in a lot of places or it's it's and it's not it's not alive in the way that it could be but then the type of mosaic of habitats that we need for the environment to be really healthy are perceived as problems like the scrub and so that's one of the things uh I got a lot out of from reading Isabella Tree's book on the Nep estate yep. because when I look at the photos of the Nep estate where it's got all these patches of scrub it speaks to me in a way that it it's like it's come down through my ancestry and I recognize it I look at it and I just go that's what it should look like there's this it's not these square fields it's not these boxed out hedges there are just this mosaic of things going on and it's in that that we then get the opportunity to explore and when we explore we understand and then we find our connection again and I think it, that's something we don't have the opportunity yeah. to do much it's the I mean I've actually been lucky enough to spend some time at the Neff State and I've met um Charlie and Isabella 
um we did actually I did a biological recording course there <laughs> things, with their ecologist Penny and it is and that was and that was quite a few years ago now I think 2016 2017 time so it's I mean even now it's it's there's been a big change even since then and it is just this we have this I think it's sort of from the industrialization and Victorian era this desire for neat and tidy don't we and mm -hmm we see nature as messy and we don't you know when we see it <laughs> when it ceases to be invisible it's normally because it's become a problem for us and um you know and that's and we we've lost this whole understanding of um the value of things like that like you said the scrub actually protects the young trees the little saplings it protects them from being grazed upon by wildlife and so if you constantly remove all the scrub you you have you lose your nur your tree nurseries basically because that's what they are aren't they those little pockets and um, yeah yeah I worked for a obviously I worked for a conservation organization one of one of the things the volunteer groups were sent out to do was scrub bashing which <laughs> benefit of hindsight you just go eh, possibly not the best of things but you know, it's 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 the problem we've got, I think, is that we have to roll back the tide on a lot of our protected spaces because we don't have a network. If we had if they were all joined up, we would be able to allow them to do their own thing. But we can't. We have to manage them quite intensively in order to keep the spaces available for those habitats and those um, plants, those animals that are so threatened which means that we can't actually have a progressive approach to conservation and, and nature in this country because well, we're scrabbling to protect it. Well, one of the, the keys of, of things like NEP and rewilding is obviously the use of the animals, isn't it, who would naturally manage certain areas. So it's trying to find that balance of us basically doing that job because in, particularly in this country where we lack um, a lot of the the sort of historic wild larger mega fauna that should be here yeah um so it's trying to find that that way to to balance it but not overstep <laughs> and i mm. think it it is a difficult balance to make but i think there are you know there's more and more people aren't there who are starting to embrace this kind of concept of rewilding making space a bit more as a regenerative farming um it is slowly trickling through in places and there is starting to see people like yourself who are starting to listen to nature and partake in nature rather than just viewing it and and being separate to it. And I, I do think there's this real need to allow na nature to talk. Um, so what I mean by that is that quite often we end up trying to control what it's doing. So, um, you know, when I read a lot of posts in wildlife gardening, it's like, should I pull this out? Should I pull that out? Should I, should I do that? You just think, well, why don't you just leave it and see what happens? Uh, and, you know, I've, we've got this, we've got a front garden is quite small, but we, we turned it into a meadow 16 years ago. And I've watched everything move. We planted it where we planted it, but I've watched everything move to where it wants to be. It's sort of gradually moved, and that's the non-interference approach. And that's something that is part and parcel of the psychology of the connection with nature because we want to control it and we want to understand what's going to happen. But part of the beauty of listening to nature is allowing it to do its own thing. And that, to me, is like my starting point for thinking about business. It's like, would you listen to your business. What does it actually want to do? Um, because it is, to me, every business is an expression of nature. If we're nature, so is our business. So why, why is it following these prescribed, regimented, limiting approaches when it could be finding what comes next because we do need a what comes next we can't carry business as usual is going to destroy everything that it depends upon so we do need a new approach what's that going to look like and that, that that's where we need the floodgates to open for lots of people to think about things in different ways yeah and I think um particularly small businesses I, I mean I don't know the scale of business that you work with but sort of the the small to to medium enterprises seem um probably more keen to 
immediately adapt some of these principles and more able to I think because they have less people perhaps to work with less um, constraints on themselves but I I mean I, I think a lot of people have been waiting for sort of the governments and are starting to get to the point where they realize that that's not where the answer comes from and actually mm. it's going to come from this sort of grassroots movement and businesses are uniquely placed to to play a huge part in that and I think that's where your your role is is quite special isn't it and that you're basically helping yeah. see the, the, policy doesn't change culture people when you impose a policy on people they kick back against it yeah. culture actually directs policy so we have to change the culture. And when you said that, you know, some of the bigger businesses are less able to, it's, it's not so much that they're less able to because they've got more people. It's be they're less able to because they're so tied into the existing model. Whereas the smaller businesses are very capable of adapting, shifting, creating new ideas. And not all of them will survive. And that's, but that's part of the pioneer sp species. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Every, you know, if you think about pioneer species, they are there to prepare the ground. That's what they do. The birch moves it in to make it possible for it to become a woodland. That's its job. Um, so, And that's what a lot of the businesses that are coming through need to be. And some of them will, will survive and some of them won't. It, it depends on how adaptable they are and how they understand their ability to evolve. But So the smaller businesses are the ones who can be the most innovative and they can shape a different culture. And I think the most important thing around business is that we change the expectations. And some of that's about the narrative of what does it mean to be successful? Because right now we measure it in one way and one way alone, and that is productivity and the economic benefit uh, the return. Yeah. And that doesn't take into account. Well, it, no, it, it entirely depends on stripping the earth of its natural resources. That is that that's yeah. the correlation. So how do, I want to see businesses that are part of the ecosystem. And so, so rather than business ecosystems, I want to see ecosystem businesses. I want to see ones that are not just uh, mitigating, I hate the word, mitigating their impact, you know, reducing their impact. I want to see them be an active part of the ecosystem. I have no idea what that's going to look like because every business is going to be different. But that should be a principle to me that people are, are pursuing so that it's shifting the entire narrative of business into a place where we engage nature, we engage community and social responsibility as much as we engage our need to be generate economic returns. Because ultimately, I suspect in not too distant future, that concept of economic return is going to look extremely different and we're going to have a different way of considering performance or considering how we structure our societies at the moment it's entirely built on our economic model the capitalist model defines all of our cultures at the moment so we have to so for, for me the lodge even though i'd be quite happy to go out and garden for the rest of my life or and, and re get some land and do some rewilding on it i would be very happy for myself changing business is our route into changing our cultures and our connection to the nature because they, that's the path through which we've lost it yeah that's my view anyway and i think well i think it's important to you know we we can't just burn down everything that we've got now we need to have a bridge from where we are to where we want to go and I think what you're talking about is a way to provide that bridge to say well we've still got this this business model that we you know that predominates in society where we value economics above all else and but we can work within some of that framework and we can but we can slightly start to change that narrative we can move the needle of what we're trying to achieve but working in a in a way that's familiar to people so that it's easier for them to adapt and integrate it and, and move towards it and then like we don't we don't know exactly how, what direction how the bridge will look and how it will flow but we know where we're, we're trying to go but it allows more people to come along for the journey I think when it starts in a way that's that does have some familiarity for them so that they can it's not so much of a change is it and it's so, because I think change too big a change is too much of a shock um, yeah. 
and then people don't do it and absolutely well, it's, yeah. it's terrifying there's um there's an amazing interview on youtube with daniel schmachtenberger and i think it's called phase shift for, for humanity and it's it is it, incredibly um good interview but what he talks about is how when there's change coming the thing is we don't know what it's going to look like because we ain't there yet. so and that's the problem we think well i don't have the answers so we can't make a move and that um uh, paradox um is is the thing that you know i i I'm working on is like, how do we, as you say, how do we cre create that bridge? How do we start the process of movement and remain open to what's on the other side of taking any step? Because the minute you've taken the step, you've changed the entire field mm -hmm. and therefore a whole load of new things come up. And that's why diversity of, you know, and collaboration and conversation is so important because no one person can have the answer. Yeah. You know, it's it's in conversation that, you know, something sparks something in someone else and then that sparks something else in you. And between you, you make far more progress than you ever will on your own because yeah. you haven't got that diversity of perspective. I think that's that's really important is I was talking to a, another guest um, a little while ago and we were talking very much about how, you know, this there's certainly been almost a little bit too much reliance on science having all of the answers. And actually part of it is, you know, how you interpret that science. And as creatives, um, we sometimes have an ability to view things in a very different way to scientists. And we can take like what they're seeing and say, oh, well, hang on, maybe you should try this because we think a little bit differently. But equally, they can also come along and go measure the impacts for us as well so it's it's a question like you say of this there is just I mean one thing that always seems to come up in all my conversations is this idea of community and collaboration and that we just need to I think be more open and I think that's what your like your conversation and wisdom from nature is about as well isn't it is just yeah you know this idea of there is wisdom out there and and sometimes it actually sometimes it's from other people but sometimes it is from like the land and the elements yes. and the seasons and it's just being open to the fact that we need different ways of doing things we might not even have the answers but we just need to have the openness to to look for mm -hmm. those answers and ways yeah well i'm not surprised that collaboration comes up because that is a natural principle it's the natural principle it's the <laughs> not the entire natural order is based on collaboration and we've got this idea i think darwin may have had a little to do with that uh you know the survival of the fittest and it's all competitive but it's not it's it's very much interactive and you know everybody knows that you know, every every part knows that it's dependent on everything else and i think one of the things when i was doing my my master's in environmental management one of the things that we did a module on environmental economics and we talked about the tragedy of the commons and that is a concept i come back to time and time and time again is that we are in the tragedy of the commons where we you know we're so afraid that someone else is going to have what we could have that we just strip it all out and that doesn't happen in nature you know, that we can't have dominance of one thing in nature. Otherwise, you get a system collapse. And when you get a system collapse, then you get a new system that comes into place. So there is a constant evolution in that. But uh, yes, it's 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 a it's a big shift that we need to be making in our thinking. Um, not an easy one to make. I'm, you know, I don't think any of us think that this is necessarily going to be an easy process. Well, I, know, I think maybe that's that's another um, problem that we struggle with in society, isn't it? Is that we have been kind of um, a little bit indoctrinated into this idea that something has to be easy, otherwise it's that you don't do it almost, don't you? It's like you know, take the path of least resistance kind of idea. And I think... Mm. Um, it, I mean, we're talking about big changes, aren't we? And that that isn't going to be easy. Um, it's not necessarily that there's going to be resistance either, but it's not straightforward because, like you say, it's the pioneer species. You know, they've got to come into this sort of bare ground and, you know, make it habitable for everyone else. Um, 
Yes, there's one thing we know. It is the governments aren't going to innovate their way through this. It's just not possible. It's not within their repertoire. They don't understand what it takes. They haven't got the flexibility either to do that. So it's going to come from the ground up. It has to come from the ground up. There's um, there's a wonderful video on from Martha Beck on, on, called The Pyramid and the Pool, which is one I come back to. If, if you haven't seen it, it's basically, it's a pyramid of sugar cubes. And she explains social change by pouring uh, a jug of water into the bottom that the, the pyramid is sitting into. And of course it dissolves from the bottom down. So structure changes from the bottom down and transformation and innovation comes from the bottom. So actually that's where the real power is right now. And of course, what's underneath us, if we, if we see the human pyramid, what's underneath us is nature and nature actually has way more power than we like to give it credit for. Uh, and, you know, has is, is kind of really pretty tolerant with us. But I, what I love is how resilient it is. And if you give it an inch, it'll take a mile, you know, mm -hmm. and that's that's kind of what we need to do is is just be saying, you know, I it's an invitation to nature. You know, when, whether we want to listen or whether we want to do something or we want to do res restoration or whatever, whatever it is, it's, it's an invitation to say, I'm open to communication and I'm open to seeing what you can create, because in that we we there's so much learning for us. Uh, and certainly on a business front, that simple opportunity to sit in conversation with nature and say, well, how do I do this? How do I honor what i feel to be the right path when none of the tools that i have in front of me are fit for ta fit for the job and they're not fit for purpose so so i mean i don't know a single business tool that is fit for purpose for anybody who has got a conscious approach they want to see something very different they want to feel comfortable they don't want to feel that they're pushing people into making decisions they don't want to be operating in ways that is actually very harmful to them and to the people that they're working with and to the environment so they need new tools um, and nature is the best teacher we have possibly got you just sit and and talk to talk to nature and ask or just observe and see how nature does it i'm not um I think probably about five or six years ago, I thought, oh, biomimicry, that's a really fascinating pathway. And interestingly enough, I've never pursued it because I think it's not right to mimic nature. We have to find how to be part of nature. Yeah. So yeah, instead I... of mimicking those systems, we need to think about how do I operate as part of this yeah. system? Become how do part I live? of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think. I think you're spot on when you, um, you know, there's there's some amazing books being written um, from the perspective of, of a lot of the indigenous cultures around the world. And one of the key threads of theirs is always the that we were a part of the cycle. We weren't separate to it. We didn't just observe it. We we had a, an important role to play. Yeah. And I think what you're saying there is is completely aligned with that isn't it it's just that we need to put ourselves back in to the cycle and but in a positive way I mean, instead yeah. of how we how we have been behaving um in such a destructive negative fashion but we have to we have to learn to listen in order to do that it's not possible that's the, that's the one thing that you get from all of the books and, and the indigenous knowledge is that you can't just plow in there and and take action you have to listen to understand how how to act um and it's and it can be very subtle and very nuanced um and and we just don't have that um awareness of what's going on i mean and we coming back to the concept of invisibility if you if you walk down a country lane in this country and you walk down that lane in april and then you walk down that late lane again in July, you would be potentially, you would be forgiven for thinking that the exact same flowers were out because it looks like the dandelions are still out. It looks like the cow parsley is still out. 
we have to look much closer because when you look that much closer, you realize, oh, those aren't dandelions and that's not cow parsley. Yeah. You know, we have a lot of, of different plants that look very similar if you don't look closely. But yeah. once you look closely, you can't but not see that they're different. And I, I mean, that's a huge, that's a huge educational piece there that has to 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 happen but you know how that's <laughs> yeah a stick to my bit yeah <laughs> really and I, I mean I have been doing that in terms of sort of like community communication about you know oh look this is this is this flower and that's that flower um and in fact the community newsletter you said wouldn't it be amazing if we put something tear off strip at the bottom of everything that said here's what to go out and look for this month and I think that that sort of enthusiasm is amazing because most people say I just don't I can't I can't see what what's going on in here they it's just long grass or whatever they can't see the different bits and it, it doesn't take much to to learn but it does take a willingness to look yeah and be open to it so I think you know there's there's so many things that we need to address and if each of us is addressing those things in our own way and from our own perspective then we've got the whole covered really and that's that's which is why we come back to collaboration collaboration is yeah. so important yeah I am um, sorry it just started raining quite heavily here <laughs> it's, mm. like, it's a strange noise I was like oh goodness what's that um but yeah it does um it does come back to collaboration and it comes back to I think you you've you've said the word a couple of times and um it's something that I part of the reason I started the podcast is that people quite often feel powerless mm. and they find they feel like they can't do anything and they're you know they're desperate to do something to help and to cha see change and but they they feel like nothing that they can do is is going to make a difference and then often they feel a bit overwhelmed by that so they don't do as much as they perhaps could um and I think I loved your analogy there of the sugar cubes and I I'd like my I hope my listeners will, will have listened to that and they remember that you know they're one of the little sugar cubes at the bottom and actually they can they can help bring the whole pyramid down really it's like yeah. in in the in a nice way it's like you know yeah. they they have this amazing role to play and it might feel small but the smallest of actions can actually make mm. a big difference yeah I, I absolutely it's and it's about action it's so we've we've kind of got into this mentality I think where you know you've got to shout loudly and be heard and and kick up a stink about things in order to change it from the top but actually the actions change it from the bottom and every action that you take and you stick by and you defend that action and you say why it's important if you say it to yourself first and then you say it to the, your, your immediate circle then it ripples out and the the speed at which that ripples out you know you couldn't orchestrate that any other way at that speed it's just it's not possible so you have immense power to make those changes and just the 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 willingness to be open to doing things in a different way the willingness to question why is it always been done that way why am I doing it that why am I doing it that way you know all of those things allow you to just live a more conscious life and the more conscious you are about how you live it then the more conscious you are of its impact on everything else around you and then it's just it's a snowball effect so there really is huge amount of power involved for everybody who feels powerless yeah I, I think that's um it's a lesson that we all need to hang on to don't we especially in our times of like despair like a, a lot of people have felt over the the sycamore tree this year this week um yeah and I think it is just remembering that like we aren't powerless and we we do have the power to just do little things and like you said those ripples sometimes we don't even know how far those ripples reach and we might never know and um that's the beauty of it as well isn't it it's mm. the amazing power of of what one individual can do and the differences they can make um but I know in your business you also talk quite a lot about seasons and you did touch on it a little bit earlier about the fact that as a society I think we're sort of 
perpetually stuck in one season really aren't we oh um, god yes um, <laughs> yeah you know, so I don't know if you just want to sort of touch a little bit on um how the seasons have impacted how you sort of help businesses how you even in your own life I guess they probably impact you well yeah they they I mean they do we all feel different in every season um but the main thing is is understanding the cycle because the seasons present a cycle and so we are in this cultural space of constant productivity which doesn't value integration and consolidation so every time you go through a period of personal growth or uh, the growth in your business or you've learned a new skill or whatever it is you need to actually consolidate that and there is a period of quiet that comes and we're about to descend into that in in the UK now and in the northern hemisphere as we go into autumn we're moving into a quieter phase and that's a phase of integration and in my membership which is based on rewilding businesses we're going to be working on creating the structures that actually hold all this this sort of like new ideas and this new momentum that people have been getting over the summer it's like well you need some way of holding it you need to integrate it you need to be able to work with it and take it forward because what happens mostly and I learned this through working with the elements um, as you know sort of like a, as conceptual rather than physical is that if you don't do this work then all of that inspiration and all of that energy just evaporates it needs to be held somehow. And that's what we're going into it's seasonally now is this period of where we actually say, right, I'm going to keep that energy safe. I'm going to work out, you know, what it's becoming because, you know, in, in a in the elemental cycle, we're talking about putting seeds into the earth and waiting for them to blossom. So the seasonal cycle takes us all the way sort of like through that quieter time. And we need to make space for that quieter time. And that might not come just at this time of the year it comes actually all the time when you're in business or when you're in in life we are doing anything creative it comes all the time because you can move through a creative cycle in 10 minutes or you can move through a creative cycle in 10 years it's just different phases of it but we need to learn to appreciate that quieter time instead of this constant upward trajectory of results that yeah. is expected of us at every every corner uh, and that's that's really what I've learned about seasonal approach is learning how the seasons actually physically affect us and how we feel in each season because everybody's different but also learning to pay attention to what's happening in nature through the seasons and what changes are happening and and why and what we can really learn from that when we're listening to it we do just have this tendency don't we of um I was thinking when you were talking about um that I was thinking about how we view procrastination as well actually and it's got such a negative connotation hasn't it of this well you know you've, you've got to be doing haven't you that's our society it's got to be busy doing all the time and if you're not then you're a bit lazy and you're procrastinating on something and just avoiding it and um sometimes procrastination is not procrastination it is your intuition saying hold up and I get that quite often. I think, I, why, why can't I make progress on this? <laughs> and then, you know, the, out of the blue, I'll just suddenly, Foomph, it'll go. You know, you'd get it all done, but, you know, spend months just going, why is that still on my list? It's, <laughs> it's driving me nuts. But, you know, you're not ready to move forward with it. And that's because something else needs to drop into place first. I think, um, you. I mean, you talked about your, your pony earlier. I've got my own horses and um, I've spent time with like natural horsemanship trainers and and sometimes you'll you'll be trying to you know sort of train a skill or work with a skill and you'll get a bit stuck and you know just you're sort of trying to do it and you can't do it and actually one of the the biggest skills is just to walk away from it and sometimes you'll just put it down and you might not touch it again for you know it could be a week or two couple of weeks even a month or more and yeah. then you come back to it with your horse and your horse goes Oh, I'm I remember. Now. And then, and then you just do it perfectly. Yeah, I, I, 
I remember that one. I I was I was teaching Zed Pony to um to walk sideways down down the side of a building. And she, oh my God, she jackknife, jackknife, jackknife. <laughs> and then out of the blue, she just suddenly got it one day. Yeah. Or I got it. Who knows? But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it, isn't it? It's like whether you ask the question the right way or whether they had the finally had the right answer. It's probably a bit of faith, but it's just the yeah. you know, there's a whole idea that actually sometimes the not doing can provide more of an answer than the doing and mm -hmm. um it's the the things that are going on in the background which I guess again comes back to your seasonal cycles the you know the you've mm -hmm. planted the seeds and actually you know over winter you, you don't really have to do much with them you just have to you know obviously make sure maybe something doesn't come and dig them up and, <laughs> and eat them but they they can they just sort of look after themselves in their quiet time and their busy you know germinating yeah and... i mean if, the, if you think about it, i mean seed is like this concentrated energy source um but it needs a lot of things from the earth in order to you know it needs the structure it needs water it needs warmth and all these things it, it needs all of that in order to be able to germinate and i think people are so scared of doing nothing in business and i understand that um but actually sometimes it's just about taking a step back and saying what do i need how do i want to resource this what are the the soil and the water and the warmth that i need in order to progress this idea because we need to connect to ourselves you know we just need that space to say what do i need right now god we just don't create that in society I, it it i find it so soul destroying sometimes when you look at education and how it's just our young children that just don't get that space. Well, we're never asked to ask ourselves what we need, are we? We're no. told what we need. I think that's the whole thing with, you know, healthcare, education, everything. The whole time yeah. it's someone else outside of you saying, oh, do this. You, this is what you need. And yeah. there, there is very little space made for you to sit and say, well, actually, you know, doing that doesn't feel good to me. Maybe mm. it works for, you know, 90 percent of people but actually for me it it doesn't feel good it makes me feel worse or um yeah. and in business as well you know people like you said people are individuals and you know some people work better in mornings some people work better at night they you know everyone has these different ways that their bodies react and behave yeah. and the and influences that, uh, they need yeah and and also different ways of putting what they're doing into motion you know not everybody can is can do all of the things you know? and that's okay I think giving people permission to say no it's okay you don't have to be this generalist you don't have to be good on video and on audio and and be able to write and all the rest of it if it's you know do what makes you feel good and do what lights you up because that's when you're more expressive that's when you're the, your most creative that's when you are your most natural and I, I think I was reading on your website you said something about how the businesses have this way to heal um and and I think I love that because it's it you know if, if business is created in the right way it does it just has this immense power doesn't it just to touch mm -hmm. everything that it touches mm -hmm. whether that's the person who's created it and and helping them feel more whole and healed but also the communities the people that they serve and then of yeah. course the environment as well and nature yeah yes it has a huge healing potential because it's actually also our greatest scar you know it's our greatest wound um yeah, it's probably not a scar it hasn't had a chance to heal yet but um <laughs> it, it is our greatest collective wound it's the thing that has we, we chose this economic path we chose to structure it we chose to sort of like regiment it if you like and then that's the thing that reverses it when you start to reverse that direction of travel when you start to reverse the expectations of business and you sort of say actually I hold you to a higher standard I'm going to hold myself to a higher standard in my business and then my customers and clients will say I hold you to a higher standard if you aren't doing this then you know you're not you're not good enough for me um, and I once you start to do that then you you go through the small and the medium sized businesses and ultimately the big businesses have to go oh hang on a second we we've missed a trick yeah. here yeah and that's yeah. and that's just the way it's going to go because those big businesses are set up on models which they can't change and they will probably 
when i don't know but they will probably collapse because ultimately alternative solutions will come through yeah i just i've i must admit i just got goosebumps like listening to you talking then i just was i think because it's such a big thing for me for this podcast is to give people hope and inspiration and you know and that when you were talking about the wound and that that's our key to healing as well is like you know the business businesses have have been part of the problem but they can be the solution and yeah. I think that's just a, well I it that's just a really powerful concept and I think it's a really important thing for people to start realizing is they're maybe not the enemy they could be the solution and mm. um if they're you know if, if we approach it in the right way and we find you know people like you that are you know we we share this wisdom and I think you know there's I mean another thing that we oh, I often come back to is um trying to be less judgmental as well um yeah so that uh, you allow people the space to change because we've all done the best we can up until this point haven't we and and yes you know some of us have perhaps you know done things differently to others and, and perceived better than others but everyone has the opportunity to change and mm. move forward and um I think judgment restricts that sometimes yeah and there needs to be that gap between well this needs to change and giving people a pause to actually consider how it's no good just sort of like right now 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 um and that certainly I don't know I get that with, with the petition sites you just get this constant like it must have happened it has to happen now it's just like well actually yes you need to express something here and you say we expect a change actually there is a well weight of opinion that it says there is a change needed not government levels of procrastination which are extraordinary but you know that it still needs to be space for the average person to say hmm uh, how can I shift that? How can I make that work? And how can I sort of gradually change myself? Because it is a gradual thing. Yeah. Nobody, as you said earlier, you know, you big changes, not necessarily helpful. We want to make the changes in a way that allows us to adapt naturally. Yeah. And then, then they become embedded and then they become consistent. Well, I mean, if we, if we look, um relate that back to ecosystems as well and part of the issue with with the the climate changes that we've got is that it is such a big change that it's creating this shock impact on the um you know biodiversity wildlife plant life that can't adapt it can't change and so mm -hmm. we need to learn from that wisdom as well don't we of like yes we need to do it in a way that we can we can adapt and we can make the changes and we can move forward mm. yes we need to to yes do it in a way that is is sustainable come back to that lovely word but it, yeah, it does need to be sustainable <laughs> yeah oh well lovely Polly I think um we're sort of getting to the point that it seems like a, a natural place to wrap up but I don't know if you just have anything else that you sort of feel like you'd like to share any wisdom on your heart that you perhaps haven't had the opportunity to voice today so far it's not that i haven't had the voice to 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 i haven't had the opportunity to voice it get the, get my words out it's more that i wanted to reinforce it and that is the hope message that it's not all doom and gloom um and that we all have the ability to make a real change and a really positive contribution and if we hold that in our hearts then we will never feel powerless again that's beautiful absolutely beautiful well thank you polly um i will include um the details of your website for people that want to get in touch with you reach out maybe find a bit more about what you do but do you want to just quickly share um a little bit about the ways that perhaps people could work with you if they felt inclined or drawn to you well, anybody who's an entrepreneur um, or has their own um, business, and it doesn't need to be an online business, it can be an, a bricks and mortar as well, wants to explore how to engage nature in your business, then I have a monthly membership uh, where we follow the seasons and we look at the, the main themes and every month every, we have a, a core business area of development that we're looking at and um, has a task to go and um, sit with nature and explore with nature 
an alternative way of approaching that so that's something that we and then have a community to go and communicate and converse about that and, and just explore the ideas and see what's see what's um sparked um so if you were interested in doing that then that's available on a link through my website oh, perfect lovely and your um i'll put the link to your website in the, the show notes below but if you want to just tell everyone what it is it is just basically polyhearsy.co.uk perfect Oh, well, lovely. Well, thank you again, Polly, for sharing your wisdom and guidance with us today. It's been a fantastic conversation. I've very much enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I just hopefully we can we can do it again sometime. And hope so. uh, yeah, I look forward to you um, following more and, and seeing more of what you're, you do and share. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a, it's been an excellent conversation and I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Polly. Thank you so much for listening to the Nurtured by Nature podcast. I truly hope this conversation has brought some hope and inspiration into your life. I would love to have these messages ripple out across the world. So if you can, please share this episode with your friends, leave a review on your favourite podcast player and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. I would love to hear from you, so please feel free to connect with me on the links provided in the podcast description. But most importantly, thank you so much for being a part of this journey with me. But don't forget to simply get out there and enjoy the natural world.